uh, so James Ed, our, our panels, um, going to be looking at the differences between the gaming markets in Asia and the West. So at Nico Partners, we've actually tracked the China and Southeast Asia games market since 2002. Uh, back when it was only a $200 million market, now it's uh, more than $35 billion market. And when you um, add in Japan and South Korea to that, um, Asia is a, you know, approximately 50% of total uh, global games revenue itself. So Asia is huge, um, games revenue is growing there, and there's a tremendous potential for games. Uh, so with that uh, being said, I'll start asking some questions, and I'll start with a, a bit of a broad one for everyone here, which is what, what makes Asia an enticing and important market um, that makes it a market for, for gaming companies to consider today? I'd, I'd like to start uh, with like a basic concept is um, when you're thinking about like I want to put my game in Asia, uh, Asia is not a thing. Like there is no like Asia, right? There's China and there's Japan and there's Korea and there's Southeast Asia and there's Taiwan and all of these places have different audiences, different tastes, different markets, uh, very importantly different economies, uh, different ways that they pay for games. And so, you know, if you meet somebody and they're like, I can get you into Asia, yeah, don't, don't talk to that person. You, <laughs> you need to talk to people who actually have some sort of knowledge in these different areas because they're, they're wildly, wildly different areas. And so a question like, you know, why is this an interesting place to be? That answer is going to differ wildly between, say, being in the Southeast Asian market versus being in the China market versus being in the Japan market, which are all uh, have their own challenges. That, that makes sense to you guys, right? Absolutely. So Asia is not one monolith. It is um, made of different countries, different people, different uh, traditions, customs, gameplay behaviors, uh, and as I said, economies as well. So with that in mind, how should companies approach Asia um, and th the specific countries within Asia, uh, given the differences between all of them? I, I'm going to jump in here because I think to drill down one level beneath the Asia being a monolith, I do think, however, when you're thinking of staffing up resources to a attack this half of the world, um, you can think about China and the rest of Asia, because mainland China has, especially on mobile, has I would argue China, of... North Asia, Southeast Asia. Would yeah, probably three be zones. A, yeah, I would look exactly. at it that way. Um, but a lot of people look at the map and they're like, oh, look at the market, look at how much spending there is on mobile, for example. So you see China as a big pie and you see the rest of Asia as a big pie. But in terms of the amount of labor and resource as a publisher or developer to get your products into the market and you know people spending money and everything china is just as much work as the rest of it put together Easily. and you could argue the rest of world frankly yeah. um so that's that's how i divide them and then i agree with you totally chris southeast asia and then north asia sort of ex china if i could say something um I'd also take a good hard look at your content. I know we're going to look at um, localization and, and all of that, but um, you have to start with you know, what you have, and certainly you can adapt it, but you really have to look at that content and, and try to understand where that market, or what the market is for that content. And just as you said, each one of these countries is radically different in terms of how they consume content. So I, I would really, uh, you know, I used to be a, a content creator, now I'm just a business guy, but, but I would say definitely take a hard look at what you're producing and, and try to understand the local markets that you want to get into as a, as a starting point. Thanks. I agree with that totally. We've got a very, 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 very simple concept called Beat the Intro, so guess what the music track is. And we're being driven very much by the content providers, by Universal, by Sony, by Warners, because Asia, or well, the parts of different bits of Asia, are becoming increasingly important uh, for back catalogue and for breaking artists. So for the last 18 months, um, that part of, of the globe has really, really exploded as far as the content providers are concerned. I, I would add one other thing, which uh, I think content is extremely important, but people, when they think about content, they tend to think about like the visuals or what it looks like or what it plays like. But I would say perhaps more important than that is the way it monetizes, right? Um, especially if you're looking at, say, China versus Southeast Asia versus Japan, the, you know, the, the way in which they can pay for something. And most people in Indonesia or, Southeast, uh, or the, the developing countries, they don't have credit cards. They can't pay with credit cards. They can't, they can't use the Google Play Store, right? I mean, then, and so they're in a very different world 
than say a Japanese market where you know you've got much much higher income for people they're much more willing to pay for things so not just looking at you know hey this game looks Chinesey or whatever you know look at, looking at the art and saying oh this art looks like something a Chinese person might like or whatever that's only part of the question the other part of the question is um, is this game going to monetize the way that these people want to monetize in this country? And, and again, a place like China, you're talking about like, what, a fourth of the world or something like that. Within that market, there are so many sub-markets of different kinds of people. I mean, it's, it's, you can honestly think of China almost as an entirely different world, separate from, I mean, and it's, it's as big, and it, China alone is as big and diverse and, uh, frankly, profitable as most of the rest of the world combined. So it's, it's, a, it's a much, much deeper question, and it's not something I would go into Although a lot alone. of pe people would say it's easier to conquer the rest of the world in its entirety. Yes. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, um, just to be clear, when I was speaking about sort of content, I, I, I agree with everything that you said. Um, I was actually thinking in my head about um, mechanic. Yeah. And I think mechanic and sort of monetization are sort of two sides of the same coin. But, yes. um, but yeah, you have to take a, look, a hard look at your mechanic and see if that mechanic has a chance of actually doing well in whatever territory you want to go to. And also in terms of content, um, pop culture trends tend to travel around regions. And so there's a lot of sharing between particularly China and Japan and Korea. Yeah. And then Southeast Asia often follows a lot of those North Asia trends. Yeah. So sometimes if you have, you know, if you're trying to launch a sort of a, a, a sequential strategy in Asia, you may start with one of those markets that tends to be a trend setting market, and then you can expand your product reach to other markets that typically like to follow successful products that are trending in those markets. Can you talk a bit more about those differences between products that are successful in the West and perhaps the changes that they make or um, the additions that they have to find success in certain countries within Asia? Okay, here's a simple one. Um, I'm going to say Chinese players, but Asian players in general always like to w have a way in a game to be able to pay to be successful. Yeah. So the thought is, if you had all the money in the world, you should be able to be number one on the leaderboard. Um, and that is sort of anathema to sometimes how Western companies think about building games and sort of principles of equality and, um, and skill in a game. I would say another big one, and this is, you know, we, we talk a lot about China, and China is obviously the, the big elephant in the room. Everybody wants to do well in China. Uh, obviously, my expertise is, is more in Southeast Asia and in developing countries. And in a lot of developing countries, you have to look at what is the level of income in those countries. And so if you're saying this whole game is designed so that, you know, I expect people to spend, you know, $5 at this point, if $5 for somebody who makes $250 a month is a lot of money. Right? And so you have to say, well, this guy's person, or this guy's time is actually way cheaper than the time of somebody in Japan. And so they're willing to watch ads. They're willing to grind. And so the kind of mechanics that you would put into a game in a region where somebody who values their money way more than their time is going to be different than a place like in Japan where people have quite a lot of money and their time is quite important and they're willing to say, look, if this saves me 30 seconds, I'm happy to throw down a couple hundred yen and get past it. So, you know, the, the kind of ways in which you build your mechanics to somebody of varying economics levels can be quite important in Asia as well. I think a lot of people, when, when thinking about Asia, um, have this idea that their games must be free to play because that is the dominant model there uh, for how games are distributed and, and monetized. So can we talk a bit about sort of why free-to-play games are so popular, what monetization methods work best, which is something you've covered a bit, but then also is there room for other models, for example, premium games? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say no. Um, well, I, I think this goes back to what Chris was just saying. Free-to-play, I think, largely originated in Asia because people didn't have income levels to pay for games up front. Um, so it began as a way to get into the experience, but there's an understanding that, you know, I think free-to-play is a habit that's been trained and ingrained in the market for almost 20 years, I think. I, wasn't, I was not a console and web game guy, so I can't comment on the 10 years before the last 10 years. Um, but I believe it's that long um, in terms of history of free-to-play. Um, and so I think it's just, it's something that everybody's accustomed to. Um, and frankly, you can, there are, there are 
tweaks on that so you can have games that you pay up front and then you know, continue to pay in the game so you can have premium games, right? Um, and that exists um, if you really want to try to squeeze the orange. Um, but I think definitely um, premium, there's not much call for. Was your question China specific or? Uh, whichever country no, is. Although, although, although there is subscription. Which there's subscription, yeah. Look, I, I certainly agree with your comments on, on mobile, yes. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think the place where we see some hope um, is 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 on p is on pc yes right yeah. where you you can have premium products on pc um it just for whatever reason that format works better for paid content i mean just to give one quick example then i'll get back to chris so um overwatch in china is actually a, a paid game compared to every other game which is free to play so that title was distributed by NetEase, uh, who worked with Blizzard to distribute it there. It sold over 10 million paid copies at around $32 each. So it shows that if you do have uh, quite a big brand and, and, and a big marketing push behind it, there is still room to find success in premium games. It is a much smaller market. It's extremely niche compared to, obviously, the, the free-to-play games market. But, uh, well, and there's Minecraft, but Minecraft's yeah. kind of accessible. Accept but I, I would add to this, though, when you say, like, this is a niche market in Asia. <clears throat> a, a niche market in Asia is, like, more people than France, yeah. right? I mean, the, the, just the volumes that you're talking about, if you can capture a, a percentage of a country like Japan, you're talking about a lot of people. And so there is actually a relatively robust premium market in particular kinds of niche games. We actually sold uh, hidden object games, premium hidden object games in Japan. And they make good money. We make good money off of those in Japan. So, I mean, it wasn't, uh, you know, Candy Crush money, but it, for a small indie studio like us, it was solid money. Uh, there are uh, Paradox, for instance, sells premium games, and they do quite well in, say, Taiwan or Korea and Japan, so I mean, if you've got a game that does well under a premium model, again, if, if you take China, Korea, Japan, uh, uh, Hong Kong, probably just that alone, you're talking about a good solid third or more of everyone in the world that plays video games. Yeah. So, yeah, a niche market in that is still very much a market. Although your user acquisition and marketing costs will vary widely by territory, very much so. like crazy. So you have to really like pick territories wisely. I think Japan right now is still the highest acquisition cost in the world, I, I believe. Awesome. So looking at um, distribution platforms, in the West everyone knows you've got iOS, you've got Android, um, sorry, Google Play and Apple's App Store, and you've got um, uh, Steam, for example, on PC. How does that differ in Asia, um, maybe China specifically or other Southeast Asian markets? Southeast Asia is probably the most complex of all of those. Uh, and the big problem in Southeast Asia is payment. Uh, people don't have credit cards down there. Um, there are a number of, and, and again, Southeast Asia is complex because you're talking about a whole a range of countries with varying economic levels and different uh, blah, 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 blah. So Google Play is in some of those markets. It's not in some of those markets. The App Store is in some of those markets. It's not in some of those markets. So. That one is actually a highly complex, way more answer than I could give you here. But the, the quick answer is, it's really complicated. And the big thing that complicates it is uh, how people are going to pay you. Um, in Japan and Northeast Asia and China, uh, China is actually also a very complicated answer. Uh, Korea and Japan is pretty straightforward. And Taiwan, yeah. Yeah, Taiwan there. You've, got, you've got Google and Apple and you're pretty much done. Um, Singapore as well, actually. And Singapore is actually in Southeast Asia because it's a very rich market. Even yeah. though it's just one city, it's actually a reasonably good-sized market. It's worth, worth considering. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong as well, actually, is a reasonably good-sized market. Yep. Um, and those are all pretty straightforward. I'll let someone else answer China because that's a whole... I'm going to nominate Daniel. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in mainland China, you do have the iOS uh, app store, but you don't have Google Play because Google services are banned there. Uh, so there's essentially more than 200 third-party Android app stores that you need to worry about uh, if you want to bring your game to China on Android. Um, but that being said, you know, the top 10, they account for 90% of the market, so you don't need to worry about all 200, but uh, just be aware that it's a very fragmented experience. There is work being done to sort of unify those platforms a bit more um, with SDKs and stuff, but um, yeah, in, in general, you just need to be aware that uh, it's a very different um, sort of distribution 
Well, and also those with those all, those other app stores, Android app stores, the complication is that um, marketing in those app stores is controlled by the app stores themselves. Right. So there's a lot of relationship building. There's a lot of, you know, um, if you're coming with a huge wave of success in another country, that bodes well for you in your discussions to try to get their attention. Um, but when you think about it, you know, think about running an app store and controlling all the marketing and ASO and everything within the app store all under one team, it means that it's, it's, very, it's a very tricky negotiation. And also some of the app stores are owned by game publishers themselves. So if you're working with a game publisher to bring a game to China and it's on that certain app store, uh, it's less likely the other app stores will sort of promote your game or give it the, the right amount of marketing. Um, but Kevin, I want to ask you uh, about sort of uh, something. Um, I want to ask you about... Yeah, um, I want to ask you about sort of working maybe like with hardware manufacturers, or service providers within Asia and China, and how that sort of helped in terms of being able to promote your game and then other games as well. Yeah, our strategy is very much about partnerships. Um, we're very lucky working with the music industry because talking about content and talking about different acts, different artists, especially the last few years, they now have very vibrant social media. So we tap into, for example, we did a test last year with Iron Maiden. Um, we've got 16 million ardent followers, so we created a game and then they promoted it and pushed it and straight away you're pushing at an open door because you know those followers are following that band or that specific artist. People forget 15 years ago when iPhone, or some forget, when iPhone was released in the UK, it was, you could only get iPhone through O2. So they created a partnership with that network that made sure that they supported it and marketed that particular phone. We are talking, as Daniel said, to hardware manufacturers about embedding the game on their particular devices and allowing them to have particularly vibrant and exclu exclusive content, especially, again, in, in the world of music. And music's never been as ubiquitous as it is now. It's never been as available as it is now. And for us, it, that's a very attractive uh, proposition. When, when, when you're looking to enter this, um, Asian countries, would you recommend working with a partner? Do you self-publish? Obviously, it'll differ depending on the region, but what's in the best approach? China, if, uh, I would say the quick answer is you're either in China or you're not in China. That's not like a, a thing you do is like, oh, and we're also going to be in China. Um, that's not a thing. Um, if you're willing to go all in and, and that's going to be a major push of your business, then okay, by all means, do that. But you, there's going to be a lot of pretty serious... And find a partner. Yeah. Um. Yeah, actually, um, I, I, I actually had to do like a whole song and dance about this internally, right? So um, I think a lot of people make the mistake of, of approaching China particularly as a business development effort, and it's not. It needs to be an operational effort. Yeah. Even though you're working through a partner, because legally you're required to, right? It still can't be seen as a, like a primarily a business development opportunity. So the way that I differentiate that is that um, a business development opportunity is really kind of, it doesn't really have its own staff, it doesn't have a P&L, it just has a couple guys and they do some relationship stuff and they say like push all the work onto the partner. Yeah. And then that model absolutely will fail, in my opinion, 100% of the time, right? You need to have an actual operational like uh, entity working to kind of capture or do whatever you need to do in that region and just bear in mind you have to work through a partner um, because of the legal requirements you can't just sort of push all that responsibility onto somebody right I mean I, I can't even tell you how many people have said oh yeah we're talking to Tencent I'm like yeah it's great Everybody's that's right <laughs> like exactly everybody Everybody's talks to Tencent to and if you expect Tencent to make your game successful it isn't going to happen okay you, you actually need to spend resources in, in order to do that so, so how do you think companies can sort of find the right partner? How do they go about I doing would, that? I would add, by the way, on to all of this, um, it's great to have a partner, and you know, obviously in China you're legal. And I would, uh, I would argue in Korea and Japan you pretty much want to find a partner in those places too because there's a whole social network of advertising companies and channels and distribution channels that you just don't know. And they're not in English. <laughs> in case there's any mistake, there's not like, oh, I'll go look at the English. There is no English version of any of that. And so I would strongly suggest that if this is going to be a big part of your push forward, there needs to be somebody on your side who works for you 
who understands these languages. Um, this is reasonably critical. And there are certainly plenty of wonderful people out there that speak Japanese and Chinese and English that can come work for your company and be the kind of people who are working with your partner. But if you're relying on your partner to provide you with all of this and you're working only in your own home language, I, I'm sorry I use English because we're in England, but if whatever home language is, it's kind of a good way to get taken for a ride. Um, I would not suggest that. I'd say that's an assured way. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, would, I would start. Southeast Asia is a little better than that. Um, in most of Southeast Asia, it's, it's still, you can kind of survive with, you know, working in English and dealing with English. But in Korea, Japan, China, no way. you really need somebody on your team who works for you, who has your best interests at heart, that speaks that language, not as like something they did in college for a couple years, but like fluently understands the culture, pr preferably lived there a reasonable amount of their, their life. I would suggest well, It's not that. even easy being a tourist in those places if you don't speak the language. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, it, I, I've seen people, they're like, oh yeah, we've got this guy, you know, he's a American born Chinese. He took a couple Chinese classes in college and you know, he looks Chinese, he'll be our guy. And you're like, yeah, that guy's gonna get taken for a ride. That's yeah, I used to be that guy. See? Yes, yeah, and me I, too. And, I was that guy too. And I tell everybody, like, look, I am American. Like, I have no idea what's going on over there. You need to hire somebody like, yep. in country yep. um, that has grown up in that culture, knows the business. Yep. Um, it, it's just essential. It's essential to do it. But I mean, my pointedly, you have that guy on your team. Yes. Plus. Apart. Yeah, that's right. correct. So, you cannot rely so on the So 10 years ago, we could have gotten away with doing that job. But today, <laughs> no. no. No way. And, and the, the, there is the sort of bright side of that is these are huge countries with very educated populations. So finding somebody in China or Japan or Korea that you, went to college in the West. You resumes than you can possibly yeah, go through. The, and, and these are great people and, and you should have some on your team if Asia is something you want to do. It's, yes. You're crazy to be doing that without that thing. Yes. Yeah, and that gets part back to the operational part, yep. right? Just don't like airmail a BD guy, BD girl so, into that. Into that and I'll, into I'll that give you an, a, a small optimistic story from within our company. We acquired a studio in Finland. Um, they had a product that had been out in the market. This is, it was out first five years ago. They had a big European publisher because they were a small indie. The, the European publisher published it globally um, and it only stuck in one Asian territory for some reason, and they made a game that was what they liked, and it's a small Finnish studio. Um, so it's very Western. And it was popular there in that Asian territory in Japan, um, and we acquired the studio, we acquired the game, and we made another version of the game, but this time we put our own secret sauce in and we made it more Asian. And we really focused on the monetization loops and little change to the art style and just you know, enhance what we thought maybe had some potential. And it's, you know, it's performed beyond our wildest dreams, frankly. Um, what, what is this product? Uh, it's Crazy Defense Heroes. Yeah. Um, and the reason is because, so it's performed really well because now, you know, we have a big Asian marketing team that understands how to do things locally. But the bright side is the product itself is still completely 100% made in Finland by a very, very Finnish team um, who knows nothing about local culture in China or Northeast Asia except for what we tell them. And we're like, no, we change the art style a little bit like this. And, you know, so we're sort of internally consulting to our, you know, subsidiary studio. Um, but it can work. It can work. You don't have to be an expert. You just have to work together. I would like to bring up a slightly different topic because this is all talking about selling your games. There's a whole nother side to Asia, uh, less so China. Well, I guess actually China as well, but there's a whole nother side to Asia that you guys should also be thinking about, which is developing in Asia, right? Yeah. And I don't think that gets enough discussion. I can tell you flat out, we've run a studio for 15 years. I've got staff in the Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, a couple other places. And if we had not spent the last 15 years working at you know, Southeast Asian rates with Southeast Asia, we wouldn't be here anymore. Um, and more and more you're seeing people move their development over to Asia. If you're doing, I was talking to somebody just the other day and they were saying, oh, I'm trying to find investment to make my game. And I was like, how much investment do you want? It was a ridiculous number. And I was like, my God, you're going to make a mobile game on that much money. And they're like, well, yeah, my staff's in San Francisco and London. And I'm like, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> just stop that and move your development to where it's more reasonably priced. So there's a whole, you could do a whole panel on 
moving development to Asia, working with Asian outsourcers. There's a lot more money to be made in Asia that's not necessarily selling in Asia, but actually distribute, or, uh, developing outsourcing. There's, you could do a whole day's worth of panels on that. Well, and for example, I have 130 people in Hong Kong where the rent is actually more expensive than San Francisco, mm. but it's still cheaper to run a studio in Hong Kong because the salaries are cheaper. Yeah. Come to the Philippines with me, and I will show you the joy of... It's okay, we have a studio there. <laughs> the, I, I would honestly argue right now the two countries, dollar for quality, best countries in the world for development, are the Philippines and Poland. And they don't get much love in the press or anything, but if you're looking at the quality of products produced and the quality of labor and the cost of labor, the Philippines and Poland, and I would say maybe Vietnam, are some of the best regions in the world. And actually China, but, you know... That's China. Thank you. Community building, community management, uh, how it's important in marketing your game. Do you feel comfortable saying anything about how it works in, in Asian territories? Is it more or less the same as here, or probably Higher not? Asians. Yeah, local, local, local. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, <clears throat> like in mid-core games, it's as essential in Asian territories as everywhere else, but you need local people who understand how to build local community. Because the things that, it, the things that connect the players um, may be very different and may be things that you really don't expect um, why they like to play the games together or against each other. Thank you very, very much. That was a really, really good session. Really, really insightful. Thank you.